welcome to live stream. Can everyone see and hear me? I think we got all the issues from last week worked out. Uh, I feel like I say that every week, but um, welcome. <laughs> I am like very tired, uh, probably because I spent a ton of time in the sun yesterday because it was 83 Fahrenheit when we went to the pumpkin patch to and the corn maze. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm just I'm ready to go to sleep, really, quite honestly. Um, but <laughs> I was thinking maybe we all just take a nap and um, nobody nobody has to do anything. We don't have to talk about budgeting. We all can just take a collective nap. Uh, Carl says, will I get a wake up call? I mean, I could nap. I don't, you know, I think napping on camera is a bridge too far for me, but there is someone who is much cuter to watch that is probably napping in the other room. I could just bring her in here. She loves to sit in this chair and uh, I could just convince her that it's uh, it's time to time to take a nap. Uh, how is everybody doing? How are, how are you all doing? Uh, <laughs> everybody wants to take a nap. It sounds like great. I agree. Um, yes, it is spooky season. It is also of the most important. It is budgetober. I think it's the most important. Maybe nobody else agrees it's the most important. But it is budgetober over on the Oh My Dollar forums. Oh, there we go. Oh, there was a nice delay. Uh, budgetober on the Oh My Dollar forums. So all the live streams this month are about different budgeting topics. Today we're going to talk about budgeting with variable income, which we talked about a little bit last week. Um, and I'm just going to talk about like my strategies as someone who's had variable income for years, tons and tons of years, uh, my strategies for how I like handle it, how I budget for it. Um, or we'll just take a nap. Um, yes, we are in fact halfway through Budgetober. Um, but you can still join if you want to. Budgetober is a totally free community exercise for, trying out new budgeting systems, getting a little support, public accountability for budgeting, uh, testing things for budgeting, and then uh, at the end, you get cute stickers uh, that are budgeting, money, Halloween, fall themed. It's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and, you know, it's fun even if you're uh, in the Southern Hemisphere <laughs> and are going to get some totally unseasonal stuff. Um you know, what is keeping me awake uh, a little bit, because legit, I was like, I've had three cups of coffee and I still am just like ready to nap. Um, but this, okay, so this was my splurge at the pumpkin patch yesterday because I like budgeted for the corn maze. I budgeted to get pumpkins, spent $12 on these pumpkins, which was like just slightly more than if I had got them at the grocery store, but I was buying the experience. Um, and it's an organic local farm. I gotta pick this guy out of the ground and then carry him around. And I, I thought I was carrying him around until I found a, like, in case I found a better pumpkin. But it turns out once you carry something around, you become attached to it. Uh, in economics, we call this the endowment effect. Anyway, I was unwilling to give him up even if I found a better pumpkin because I had carried him around. So, um, but my splurge was that I spent $14 on this fancy pumpkin vegan organic soap, but it has like glitter in it and it's like Halloween looking -y. Anyway, it's totally ridiculous. Um, and did I need to spend $14 on a soap? Absolutely not. They had, they had a bunch of really cool ones. It was actually kind of hard to choose. Um, but you know, and then I really struggled, speaking of budgeting, with where this goes in the, uh, budgeting category. I was like, is this household goods? Cause that's where I'd normally put soap, but I don't normally spend $14 on a single bar of soap. Uh, so what, <laughs> like, what do I do? I don't know. Um, you totally named him, didn't you? No, I think I'm like alarmed by naming a pumpkin that you're then gonna carve the guts out of. So I haven't done pumpkin carving in several years. So um, normally in Oregon, it's actually really hard to carve pumpkins super early. I think I mentioned this on a previous live stream. I didn't know this when I first moved here because I'm from like a place where it often like freezes overnight 
during October. Um, but here in Portland, it's usually raining, unlike it is has been the past two weeks by this time of year. And we get a lot of mold. Like, mold is a just a constant issue in the Pacific Northwest. And if you get, if you carve your pumpkin too early, then it will bloom mold on the inside. <laughs> so uh, I think we're safe now. It is 80, like I said, it's 83 Fahrenheit outside. Um, it's 100% not long sleeve weather, by the way. Um, but, you know, why not have your shirt match your soap? This is important things. Uh, and then I have this batch dress. The, uh... <laughs> I went to, I went to this pumpkin patch yesterday, so I led a ride out to the pumpkin patch, and it was, um, a, like, <sighs> pumpkin patch and corn maze ride, and I originally scheduled it, so every year, I swear, I'm gonna be the kind of person that goes out, because it's, it's not far from Portland, it's technically, like, in, it's in the same, like, county, it's just over two bridges, uh, Savi Island, that has like had a has had a really big corn maze for years, and uh, also you pick pumpkin farms. And every year, I swear, I'm gonna like take a trip up there, ride my bike up there, and like you know, uh, pick my pumpkin and bring it back. And then inevitably, I don't, I barely even get a pumpkin from the grocery store, partially because we live in an apartment building, so I like don't have anywhere to put it out. Um, but, like, I don't have any outdoor space. Here's all I gotta say, though. Uh, it was very fun. I, I, the way that I, my accountability device for making myself do it was that in late August, I picked a day on a weekend and I put it on the shift calendar, which is where you put, like, bike fun rides. So I was like, I'm having a ride. Come do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's only, it was like 11 point, no, it was 11 miles, 11 miles each way. So, I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to lead a ride uh, to the pumpkin patch and the corn maze. But it, then it was like 83 degrees. I thought that it was going to be pouring rain, <laughs> but it was not. Um, it So frankly, I think I'm just tired today because I spent so long in the sun. Because I did try to like hydrate and eat enough and everything. But I think it's just, it was too, like, it was just too sunny. It was just like hours of walking and biking in the sun. Um, luckily, we left early, so it wasn't quite so hot when we went out. Um, but look at this pumpkin patch. It was, it was very cute. It was very well set up. These were all the folks that came on the ride. Um, and this is like, this is why Oregon, you know, look at that backdrop, uh, out on Savi Island. Um, so Savi Island's only like 11 miles from inner Portland. Um, Aaron did this like fancy-ish video of everybody. Um, and the corn maze was very fun. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I had fun doing it. Um, and, uh, and carrying it around. Oh, we also took a hayride that was like, uh, maybe 10 feet. We, I made the ride. So it left like kind of early. I, I felt like kind of early for a pumpkin patch because one, I didn't want to come back when it was dark and it gets dark starting. Like it gets quite dark quite early in Portland, uh, at this time of year, not as bad as it does in December, but, um, and uh, I didn't want to ride back on the dark because part of the about three miles of the riding is on the side of Highway 30. It has a super wide shoulder. Lots of people ride bikes on it. But the traffic is really heavy during the middle weekends because a ton of people were going. So we left early and we had like the road mostly to ourselves, including the highway portion was like really, you know, it's good. It's a rural highway. So it's it's not like a like interstate or anything. Um, very common cycling route. But we had like good, not crazy heavy traffic, got out there. And then when we came back at 1.30 in the afternoon, it was back-to-back -back cars for probably five miles getting off the island coming in. So like we were on this one side and we only had like a little bit where there was a little bit of stack up of cars to like get onto the bridge, like maybe a couple blocks. Um, but the like almost I think five miles straight of back to back. So there's two bridges that you cross. So you cross like a bridge to the other side of Portland and then you like come come back and the um I it was there's three point three miles between the two bridges, and then there was like another two miles from the second bridge onto 
the farm, there was a line out, out the parking lot, the significantly sized parking lot of the farm, all the way off the island, across the bridge, and then back to the other bridge, like bumper to bumper cars. And then our side was like pretty empty. So it was definitely a lot better. Um, Eric says, that is one great pumpkin worthy pumpkin patch. Yeah, I, you know, this guy was $6. I will also say it was kind of like a fun activity to do because the way that they priced the pumpkins was not by weight. Instead, it was like these circles that would just say like $6, $5, $8. And you had to try to put your pumpkin through the circle. So it was, it's like spicy. Like Aaron got a slightly smaller pumpkin, um, which is actually here. I could go get it. Um, but Aaron got a slightly smaller, like big pumpkin and... <laughs> Uh, it was like, it was like, oh, is he going to be able to get it into the $5 slot instead of the $6 slot? I don't know. It was kind of fun. Um, Rachel says every technical book club I've ever led is external accountability for things. I continue to find myself too lazy to do. Absolutely. It's like the external accountability is very motivating to me. I know some uh, people for which that is not true, but if I feel like other people are relying on me to do it, then I will do it. Um, I'm very good at externally opposed deadlines. Like I was, I was talking with a friend about how in college I like, didn't even know you could ask for extensions, uh, until like, I don't know, my senior year or something like that. And I found out that other people have been asking for them all along, <laughs> but like my belief, what I just like, didn't know that people turn stuff in late. I just genuinely didn't know stuff. People turn stuff in late. Eddie says, how are you related to Aaron? Aaron is my spouse. <laughs> uh, Rachel says, what a cute way to price pumpkins. Thank you. Uh, the thrill of riding Highway 30. Yeah, we got passed by a lot of people like going out for spandex kind of light rides on the way. And we were a trail of 12 people. Like I was dressed in pumpkin regalia. Um, so, yeah. Um... <laughs> New Bolt One says, are the slugs banana sized? I, I didn't notice any, we don't have banana slugs really in Portland. If we do, I never see them. Uh, I've seen a lot more banana slugs in like Northern California and in Seattle, but I don't tend to see them here. Um, but no, banana slugs are like this big. They're not banana sized, but also bananas come in every size. So um, <laughs> Adabe says, I love naps, but super excited to hear you talk about this subject. Just got serious about my money. Great. Okay. Fine, y'all. You want to actually talk about things? Um, oh yeah. I also should introduce the donut. I think I'm going to have to do two donuts, um, the next two weeks because there are lots of October flavors, but this one is a butterscotch Granny Smith apple fritter. So it is local Granny Smith apples and then vegan butterscotch. I am pretty, I'm pretty stoked about it. It smells really good. Not as good as this extremely overpriced soap that I got, but you know, <laughs> it's hard to compete with my extremely overpriced soap. <laughs> oh, um... All right, y'all. Should we should we talk about variable incomes, guys? Or should we just eat the donut and then take a nap? <laughs> Adabe says that we need to actually talk about budgeting with variable income. Um, I guess let's dive into it so that we can get done sooner and I can eat my donut. Um, I did talk about this a little bit last week, so I refer. feel free to refer back to that. I think I did a previous Budgetober live stream also the month or like last budgetober about budgeting with variable income. So you have some options if you're interested <laughs> in such a thing. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, these sorts of things and strategies, and you're also always, always, always able to listen to past podcast episodes or uh, ask questions on the forums. <sighs> okay, everybody wants variable income, blah, 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 blah. It is not a pumpkin sized donut. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> but maybe a little unreasonable. Uh, I also got these cute little ones. Look how cute they are. They're so cute. I got these mostly for live streams. 
I will not be able to carve those. I don't know what I'm going to carve yet. I think I'm going to do a cat, but I might do like a, um, a money cat. I might try to do a money cat. Maybe that's too ambitious for my carving level of skills. I also found out you can just now get like attachments that you just put into the pumpkin uh, so you don't have to really carve it, which I don't know. It seems like an easier workaround. Um, but I, I, I feel like I feel like I need to really carve it. So I got a carving sized one. Also, did you know that you can get fake carvable pumpkins now made of polyurethane? Uh, that seems like extremely unsafe to me, but kind of cool, but they work. But like, I don't know, it seems concerning. Cause like, especially if you're going to put like a candle in it, maybe you only put like the electric tea light kind of style in it. Sorry, I'm getting off track, y'all. Print a 3D pumpkin. Interesting. <laughs> I did just buy glow-in-the-dark filament. Yeah, I have requested, uh, I have requested glow-in-the-dark bridges for my spooky bridge costume. Uh, Rachel says, styrofoam pumpkin. Sounds like it just makes garbage. I think the idea is that you carve it once and then you get to, like, use it year after year. You can see them on Target's website. I, I find them very weird and Actually, let's look at the carvable pumpkins and then we'll talk about variable income, you guys. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. You think, normally I'm so good at talking about variable income, but I am just tired and want to go to, I am taking a nap after this. Um... Fake carvable pumpkin. And we'll look at this and then we'll come back. Yeah, I, this is wild to me. Like, like why? It just seems, it seems not safe, but. Okay. Here, I, here's the one I found at Target, which looked like. Uh, okay, so look at these. They're carvable pumpkins, but they're made of polyurethane. I It's wild to me. Um, it does mean you can have them in, like, cool colors and stuff, but it just seems very, very, like... Also, the person that said it, they were like, oh, I, saw, I read some of the reviews, and they were like, it's quite the arm workout. Look at this. My hand feels like it's going to fall off, is what the review says. Uh, <laughs> go paint a regular pumpkin. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there's like a lot. I feel like there's like a lot of options for you other than maybe you live somewhere where you can't get a real pumpkin. I, I feel like that's like a possibility. Like pumpkins don't grow in every climate. Also, like they're not seasonal for the southern hemisphere. But I guess if you're trying to do Halloween, but you live in the southern hemisphere maybe i i'm i i do not know i i'm not entirely sure maybe you live somewhere where it gets moldy but you want to have it out all month um speaking of which i don't know why you all have to see my screen there okay um let's talk about budgeting with variable income before we dive too much into this i want to talk about the kind of two different kinds of variable income there are and how they factor into your like overall choices um, because there is really kind of two different structures. One is variable income where you get some kind of variable income, but you have a traditional W-2 job. So this applies to the United States, but there's also freelancers in a lot of countries that are in the similar kind of tax situation. Um, you know, you might have variable income because you work on commission, you work uh, very different hours and you're like an hourly worker. Um, you might get bonus checks, um, on or profit sharing checks. And so it, your income goes up and down. Maybe you work two jobs and your second job is something like, uh, you know, uh, serving. And if you're serving, then you might have wildly different tips depending on how many customers you have. Like, the f so that's the first category is that you have a W-2 job so you don't have to worry about some of the frustrations of being a freelancer or self-employed, um, but you do have to deal with the fact that you don't have, you know, the standard like, I know I get this much per month and then that's how I will budget everything out. Um, and then the second category is folks that are freelancers or self-employed. Um, and if you are a freelancer or self-employed, um, 
if you're a freelancer or self-employed, like you have more complicated things going on. You, in addition to having to submit your taxes, possibly quarterly or at least annually on your own, which means you have to set aside money every time you get money in to pay your self-employment tax. Um, you also have other things that you have to consider. Usually you have to also deal with your health insurance, which you might not have to deal with if you are through a W-2 job. And that can be super frustrating when you have variable income as a freelancer, because if you are buying your health insurance in the U.S. through the marketplace, the marketplace asks you to estimate your annual income um, and, and or your monthly income. And you're like, if you overestimate your income, then you may end up getting some extra money back at tax time. Um, but you also might have to pay more money each month than you actually need to pay because you would qualify for less premium subsidies. Or on the flip side, maybe you qualify for health insurance. Um, you qualify you or you you know are underestimating your income you ended up getting a lot more money in during the year uh than you expected and you're worried about like you are losing medicaid eligibility or you're going to have to pay back your premium tax credits the only time in which this was not true was weirdly 2020 and 2021. There was a special situation where you got your premium tax credits refunded, um, even if uh, where you didn't have to pay them back, even if you were in the category of someone who underestimated their income. I did a live stream about this because I was in that category. They actually passed the law after I'd already filed my taxes and paid my extra premiums back, which I knew I was going to have to do. So I had been saving up money for it. Uh, and then I got refunded to me. So I just got like an extra $2,300 back that I had already paid to the IRS. Um, and it took me a while to figure out what was going on. And that's because they passed the law in between when I filed tax and uh, when uh, in between when I filed taxes and when I, uh, I when they uh, passed the law so they refunded it they did refund it automatically it was very cool but also there was no explanation and I got the letter like months later explaining what was going on and it took like quite a lot of research to figure out what was going on because I was like worried that I because I had already got my refunds which were very small they were like in the hundreds of dollars range um and I was like really concerned I was gonna have to pay it back I don't know I was Concern. It, it took like a couple hours of research to figure out what was going on. Part of that was just they had passed so much coronavirus relief related that was done via the tax system that it was like very complicated to figure out what was possibly going on. Um, not dealing with pumpkin guts seems like a market advantage. I don't necessarily agree because pumpkin guts are like you can do things with them, like bake the pumpkin seeds and make delicious roasted pumpkin seeds. Um, Yes. Okay. All right. I'm going to let, I'm going to stay on topic. So with variable income, there's, there's a couple different categories of things you need to consider. One, I think the most important thing when it comes to budgeting with variable income is the traditional status of being like, oh, I'm going to fill out a budget. I'm going to sit down and say, I'm making $3,000 a month, therefore, and I know $800 goes to my rent, and then I'm going to budget $200 for utilities and $500 for groceries, you know, whatever it is, and then just kind of budget from what you know you're going to get in. With variable income, you, it is ideal to get to the point where you're only budgeting with income you already have so that you are not in the situation where if a check is delayed or something like that, you've already spent money that you don't have in yet. This is true for everyone, but it becomes a lot more important with variable income, especially if you have the kind of variable income where you spend a lot of time invoicing companies that sometimes are very slow to pay you. Um, and because when you're living paycheck to paycheck, you have a higher level of predictability of when the money will come in than if you're living check to check as a freelancer, business owner, then it that lower level of predictability you has you have means that it becomes even more important to not 
um, count your chickens before the eggs hatch. Um, and the kind of key of, in my opinion, being able to figure out how to allocate the money that you have when money comes in. Um, so let's say you have an $1,000 check come in. If you are a freelancer and have to pay self-employment tax, um, which isn't just in the United States, by the way, but it is a lot more streamlined in a lot of countries. But if you're a freelancer and have to pay self-employment tax, one of the first things you want to do is take out that tax money before you do anything else. And the reason you want to take out the tax money before you do anything else is because that isn't your money and you are going to be in a world of hurt if you spend, you don't save for it, and then you end up owing it. So the first thing you want to do is take that tax money out. In my case, the way that I, I do my tax money is that I figure out what from the money comes in is going to business expenses first, then I take the tax money out. And that is because business expenses uh, will reduce my total taxable income. And for Oh My Dollar especially, I can sometimes have very high um, business expenses relative to my income. And I don't need to save money on taxes that are going to lower my gross income. Um, so I'll do that. Then I will take that money and I move it to a separate account. And I think the separate accounts are extremely helpful when you are in the case of needing to save that tax money. And the reason why I recommend it is you can even move that to a different bank. So my tax money does not live in my main bank so that I don't start looking and seeing that total and start spending it in my head. And then additionally, the bank that I move it to, so I actually transfer it out after after I've done all my allocations for business expenses, figured out how much it is. So let's say I get a thousand dollar check. I have two hundred dollars of business expenses. Uh, so that's eight hundred dollars after my expenses. And I save 30 percent for taxes, which if you don't know how much you need to save for taxes because you this is your first year as a freelancer, 30 uh, percent is usually a good rule of thumb unless you have very, very high or extremely low income just go with 30%. Self-employment tax is 12.8% um, that you would pay in addition to what you would pay in taxes from your uh, employer because you are paying both the employer and the employee portion of your taxes, but moving along with that. So I take my expenses out, allocate them, and then I move on to my, uh, I'm so if I had $800 left out of that $1,000 check, after I budgeted for my business expenses, I would take 30% out, which would be $240. So that's 30% of the 800 I have left after business expenses. Then I take that $240 and I transfer it to my tax savings account. Almost all banks let you label your accounts, like give them a nickname. Um, I call mine taxes no touching. <laughs> And I put that money in the account and uh, it earns a little bit, bit percent of interest there more than I get in my business checking account. It's it's fairly rare that business um, checking accounts give you any interest and a lot of business savings accounts don't. And since I have a business um, business checking account, I move it to a different institution. Um, so it's called taxes, no touching, earns a little bit of interest and it's out of sight, out of mind. So that's my first recommendation is if you are in that freelancer category and you need to save for taxes, do it before you do anything else. Um, the next category of things to think about, whether or not you're a freelancer or you just have variable income otherwise, is think about paying yourself. And by paying yourself, I mean putting some money in savings because um, everybody else is going to, you know, you're, you're born, you turn 18 and then suddenly you owe everyone money. And uh, if you don't save for you, no one else is gonna do it for you. And by saving for myself first, so taking whatever percentage I'm aiming on saving and putting it into, you know, maybe you're trying to save up to get one month ahead, as was mentioned earlier, maybe you are in the situation of, um, of you know, you're trying to, you're participating in the 22 in 2022 challenge and you wanna save 22% of your income, then what you would do is you would move that money into a separate account. Um, you know, you'd save 22% of what is left there. Could make tons of sense depending on what you're doing, but my recommendation is save even just 1% for yourself. If you are 
Um, in the situation where you don't feel like you have a, flex a lot of flexibility in savings, save just 1% of what you bring in for yourself to start building that habit of taking care of yourself. Um, I feel like pay yourself, save for yourself because no one else will is like a whole damn thesis, more important than so many things. Yes, hence why I think it's like two chapters in my book. But I think savings can be extremely powerful. They give you a lot of negotiating position because saving is actually quite rare, especially in American culture. Um, and because they're rare, it can put you in a better negotiating position. If you are someone who works as a freelancer and um, you know you do have savings, it gives you the opportunity to say no to gigs that might not be a good fit for you. But if you don't have any savings, you'll feel like, oh, I have to take this gig because nothing else will come along. You know, It's just one of those things that can give you a lot of negotiating power. It can make your life a lot less stressful if you do start to save. Um, yeah. Eric says, no touching. That's a brilliant name for account. I'm a huge fan of the no touching account. So our next goal. I know that we haven't even talked about paying any bills yet, but now we're on to one of my favorite things, which are called sinking funds. So sinking funds. What is so cool about sinking funds, in my opinion? Wow, why can I not get it to go? There we go. Um, what is so cool about sinking funds, in my opinion, is what sinking funds are is they're planning for infrequent expenses on a frequent basis. If you are someone who got paid monthly or biweekly, you might put into um, sinking funds, you know, on that kind of regular basis. What I do with my variable income with sinking funds is I still have a monthly goal in YNAB, which is what I use to manage my business and my personal budget in two separate budgets. Um, but what I do with sinking funds is I actually, when I get money in, I try to fill up the sinking funds. So example of variable expenses might be something where you don't know the amount, but you know it'll eventually come up. So if you have a pet, it could be vet bills. Um, if you, uh, you know, uh, have to like a silly example, but we need air filters because the air quality in Portland has been getting increasingly bad all the time. Um, so air filters are kind of expensive and I don't like having to suddenly, you know, chalk up $120 of air filters, even though it's only like once a year, seems like a lot of money at once. So instead what I do is when I get a little money in, I throw some money into my sinking category for air filters. And the advantage of this is that, and it's not an account, it is actually just a category I have in YNAB. You could do it in a spreadsheet, you could do it in Mint, any of these kind of um, budgeting apps, which we have a stream on budgeting apps and then we're going to have a new one uh, next week, I believe, um, uh, with an update for 2022, because last year we did it in 2021. Um, but I just throw a little bit of money in there. And then it means that I feel a lot better when I do have to spend a huge chunk of change rather than being surprised. So perfect example of a sinking fund for an expense. I didn't know when it was coming. Yesterday, I ran over my phone with my bike and uh, I cracked the screen. I don't know if you can see, but it is hella cracked. Um, this phone is coming up on uh, three ish years old. And I had, it had been, the battery w is lasting no longer than a hour now. And so it, and it also keeps rejecting being charged by various chargers and just like refusing to listen to me. So I, um, and it, it goes through a lot of abuse. I have a, I have a case on it. It, I have never cracked the screen on a phone before, but this phone flies out of my pocket in my leggings while I'm spinning at the ice skating rink, like once a week. Um, so it's been through a lot of abuse and has been doing well, except the battery. So I had been going back and forth. Do I want to get a new phone? I get kind of a no, I hate that phones now cost like a thousand dollars. Um, you know, do I want to get a new phone? Um, is it, is it a thing that I want to spend money on? Um, and maybe I can get like six months to a year more out of this phone if I just pay the $50 to upgrade the battery because the battery was like the main problem. Once I cracked the screen yesterday, I was like, it's it, it's done. If I have to also replace the, because the crack was bad enough that like eventually the glass is going to come off. I was like, if I do not, if I have to pay to replace the screen, and I have to pay to fix the battery. And I already have been having like, you know, the camera super scratched on it. It's not great, probably because it flies out of my pocket on the rink all the time. 
I was like, oh, uh, I guess I got to do it. But what made it a lot easier to swallow? Um, so I have a friend who works at Apple. Uh, thank you, Joey, if you happen to be watching. I know you said you might tune into the live stream. Uh, but I have a friend that works at Apple and uh, is very sweet to let me use uh, his friends and family discount every time I need to get a new Apple product. And I have a mainly Apple ecosystem, partially because I went to the college that Steve Jobs went to. So... <laughs> I have been an Apple for a long time. Um, and my dad used to work at the company that was uh, run by Steve Jobs uh, before Apple. So my first computer actually was on the Next OS, which is what the Mac OS is based on. Anyway, random Lily fact. But I already had money in my business, uh, like budget that I had been saving up to replace a phone in. So, you know, when I bought this phone, I purchased it out of my sinking fund for my phone. And it isn't something I necessarily fill up every month. If I have some kind of extra money from a check, like if I get a huge check from a brand deal or a speaking gig that I did, then I'll start to look at those sinking funds for like more flexible things and go, yes, okay, that's, the, I'm gonna put some money in there. Take care of my future self. And so I, just perfectly had about $700 in my um, my like electronic sinking fund. And it's going to it cost me about $600 with the discount to get this uh, the upgrade for this phone, which is uh, going to appear at my house later today because it is the future and you can order a phone at like 6 p.m. on a Saturday and have it show up on a, a Sunday. Um, so Possum says... Uh, that's why your phone costs like $1,000. Well, I won't actually spend $1,000 on a phone. Um, I will only spend... <laughs> I will... I Really, $600 is about my upper limit. But I also try to recognize that I amortize uh, the whole situation over time. So I actually figured out how much per hour of screen time that I've spent on this phone since I got it. It works out to nine cents an hour or uh, like uh, 40 cents a day or something like that. And I'm pretty willing to say like, I have to appreciate, I, I, it's frustrating to me how expensive phones are now these days. Also, by the way, the re part of the reason I have a cheaper phone is because I have um, not great hands. And so I can't really use those big phones because I can't like hold on to them and use it with one hand. So I prefer the small phones. Also, I wear a lot of dresses that don't always have the best pockets. So this is the only kind of phone that'll fit in my um, pockets. So um, the advantage of uh, the, like, the thing that I have to remind myself that this phone has more RAM in it than my laptop did in 2009. This phone has more like storage space than almost any computer I have had for the past, I don't know, my whole life. Um, and I just have to remind myself and appreciate on a regular basis that I do get a lot of use around it. It is a pocket computer that I carry around, I abuse, I use for everything. And so I try to appreciate that and remind myself when I get upset about, <laughs> about it, not to get too off track. Um, but the, re I kind of went back and forth where I was like, ah, should I move to the Android ecosystem? But all my other, um, equipment is, um, is Apple. So I wasn't sold on that. And I do really like one. I mean, Google be a sketchy company. I'm sorry to say it, but it is doing some extremely sketchy stuff around security, safety, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I also trust the security and the encryption much more on Apple devices. Um, so that's part of the reason I stuck with it. But I, I was tempted by the little flippy phone one. Um, the, like they because I was like mm, I remember flip phones but this one would be a small a small phone so okay my point about sinking funds um is that sinking funds are particularly great when I'm trying to find my sinking funds nope okay um my the what is useful about sinking funds is it uses a psychology that brands use to sell you things but to your benefit so a great example is like every time you want to sign up for something like, uh, you know, let's say you want to sign up for a website that has a subscription fee and there'll be like 
oh, it's only $8 a month, but you actually pay on an annual basis. So it's $8 a month, but it's $96 a year. Um, and you're going to have to pay that $96 all at once. And $8 a month sounds a lot better mentally to you than having to come up with $96 does. Use that same psychology. They do that to sell you uh, auto insurance. That's a great example of something that works very well for sinking funds. Usually you pay auto insurance on a six monthly basis. And so they sell it to you and they're like, oh, it's only $50 a month. But actually you are going to have to pay, you're gonna have to pay $300 at once, right? Um, and so it is very helpful to kind of remind yourself and put the work in towards using that same kind of psychology on yourself to make things less stressful. I know a lot of people who get very stressed out by what I call known knowns. They know that that bill is coming, but it, it somehow becomes an emergency every time because they've done no planning for it. So what is very helpful about sinking funds is it allows you to think on a check by check basis with variable income and plan for things without having to be like, oh, I have to come up with this huge amount of money of that. Um, uh, Geograph Concept says, except I did not run over my phone, the battery just hit a point of unusability. It no longer lists a percentage. It just says, please service now. Yeah, mine was also getting to the service now situation. And uh, I also discovered a fun thing. So like I said, it's been like rejecting all of my cords. And uh, th what I discovered, it's actually like, I think a very good usability feature, but I discovered that if you have an alarm set, which I always have an alarm set in the morning, um, the, if you have an alarm set on your phone and it gets below 5% battery, it will then beep a very special like alarm beep to wake you up. So um, it because my phone was rejecting chargers, so I'd plug it in at night, seemed like it was charging, go to sleep. And then like three hours later, I would get woken up in the middle of the night by my phone doing this like frantic, I'm about to die beef, uh, which I is, I believe only when you have an alarm set and it's meant to like, let you know, like this alarm is not going to go off uh, because I'm going to die before it. So security on Apple stuff is really second to none. Yeah. Not to make this a, um, not to make this like a, <laughs> unreasonable like uh apple they apple has issues too but i do think that apple um has fewer issues around my concerns uh from from a company perspective that i have with google which is just frankly very concerning and then you know android it what is the advantage of it is that it is an open operating system and so there's lots of devices that use it and i am a big fan of that you know um ios is built on top of an open source ecosystem so you get a lot of those core flaws but then and um, on top of that is a lot of levels of security that um, are not uh, lead to better end-to-end -end encryption on a lot of things like iMessage and stuff like that, in my opinion. So there's, uh, I just got a new phone, a 6A. What is a 6A? I don't know enough about phones. I really did not want to research this, by the way, and I like tried to make the decision in like 50 minutes. For like $150 via trade. 3A, which last, last year they were only offering $50 for. The thing that blows my mind, and this is a great example of how they try to get you with that amortization. They try to get you with that, oh, you just paid this much per month. When I was looking at this, Apple was desperately trying to push the idea that I would just pay monthly for this. They really wanted me to finance this. And I didn't have to finance it because I had the money there. Um, I also try not to, I put things on credit cards and then immediately pay it off. Um, so that I can get, I was able to get the $1,000 of insurance by just putting it on my credit card. Um, but I think it's like really important to note that this cracked ass phone, <laughs> they were offering me uh, all of the major carriers, which I do not use. I use Mint Mobile. I love it because I spend only $20 a month on my um, phone um, and it works great for me. So the and I have no contract, but they desperately wanted me to sign a contract to pay $8 a month after I trade in this thing for $300, which should not be worth $300. It was $25 to trade into Apple because like the back is still fine and stuff like that. But um, this is just going to like, 
This just emphasizes to you how much these tricks are used by companies. They were like, oh, you could just pay $24 a month for this phone. Don't have to pay $700 right now. You can just pay $8 a month. We will up your trade-in from $25 to $300 if you sign a long contract with us. So, you know, it's important. Oh, Google Pixel 6a. Uh, that sounds like a good phone. It was a Pixel phone. Good to know. Um... Jenny says, I refuse to buy a smartphone. I personally don't need one in my life, so I have an ancient soap bar Nokia. You are a legend. I didn't even know you could still get those. My friends get upset that I never text because it takes so long. Man, I was so good at T9 texting. I was so fast at it. Um, I'm of that generation. It was like... Phew. And it used to drive my uh, older friends crazy because, like, most of my friends were, like, I don't know, five to ten years older than me when I was still, like, in the, like, soap... soap phone phase i was like a slow slowish adopter to a smartphone but not as slow as you jenny um but i would text all the time and like my friends were just old enough that they were not like of the texting generation and so they would be very annoyed with me because i only wanted to communicate by text message and they were not as fast on it but i could like text without looking on those t9s man i was fast at it um i miss those phones though i dropped that one out of a third story window and it still worked fine uh, but I didn't know you could still get them. Or I don't know, how long have you had that? Because mine stopped working. Um, I dropped it off a bridge and it still worked. <laughs> like a whole ass bridge. Not into the river, but like onto the train station. So like bridge height. And then I went down to the train station to pick it up and it was still working. Those things were so durable. Um, soap bar phone is now in the category of feature phone. I remember seeing that term as opposed to smartphone. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> that's very fascinating. Fancy. Financing is such a freaking trap, especially for little stuff. Yeah, and I was like, you know, they're like 0% APR at Apple because they just want you to buy the thing. Um, so that, I mean, it was very hard for me because I was, I was like, maybe I should spend $25 a month over the next two years. If it's at 0% APR, what do I have to lose? And then I was like, I don't like having to pay monthly bills if I don't have to. So that was my, and I was like, you have the money saved in the savings. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about some other strategies for variable income. So sinking funds, I think, are extremely valuable. Um, the next thing is you do really need to know your bare essentials. So you need to have a good concept of like how much your actual um, how much your actual like bare minimum is. And this is true for both your business, if you're a freelancer, but also your personal life. You need to know what are the things that you absolutely need to cover because it'll help you understand every time you get a check how long you have until the next time you get a check. So we're back to that $1,000 check. I'm going to use this because $1,000 is a round number, relatively easy to do the math on. Knowing your bare minimum expenses will really help you plot out how long they were going to live. And I, this is why I think tracking your expenses is so helpful. Yet another shout out to Budgetober if you need to kind of figure this out. But your bare minimum expenses are whatever you need to survive. These are not necessarily your debt payments. These aren't your savings. Um, but they are your non-variable core expenses. So this includes what you need to live. And this, this includes anything that you uh, need to pay on a monthly basis. So I have my bare minimum expenses that I don't need to live in my business. But I know I need to have covered. So for me, that is hosting. That's transcription. That's paying my contractors. Um, and then it is all of the freak ton of software it takes to run a media business these days. Once again, try to remind myself how powerful all this stuff is and the fact that we have it is so great. Um, but that's my bare minimum. Things like saving up for a new phone, that's not part of my bare minimum. That's an extra kind of sinking fund. Um, you know, my business fees that I pay on an annual basis cost me $100 a year. Not a huge deal because I save my little $8 a month in there and then it's fine. Um, and I just put that money in that category. Uh, I pay my hosting, uh, some of my hosting. I have a lot of hosting because the forums get a lot of traffic. Um, but, you know, I pay some of my hosting and my domains on an annual basis that I save in there um, because I need those to keep running. I need to pay my business insurance, my liability insurance. Um, I need to pay for my email servers, things like that each month. I have to pay for Adobe because as far as I can tell, I'm going to pay for Adobe until I die. Um, 
And then I have my life bare, bare minimum expenses. So for me, that is my rent, that is my utilities, that is my groceries. Notice groceries are a variable expense, but they are an expense I need to cover because I need to eat. Um, I have my, you know, my groceries. For me, it's uh, uh, my transport sinking fund. For other people, it might be gas that they need to get to gigs. Um, this is one of those categories where gas can be a lot more than what you use to get somewhere that pays you. But when you're thinking about bare minimum expenses, think about the kinds of things that you are kind of non-negotiable. You need to have to earn more money. You need to live, right? Like I put money in my clothing sinking fund whenever I have extra money around, but I don't fill it up before I fill up the other essential categories because frankly, I have more clothes than anybody could possibly need. <laughs> Um, but then like still don't have ten new tennis shoes. I bought mine for eight dollars at Goodwill and I run I've run hundreds of miles on them and I still haven't replaced them. So um you know, some things are fun for me and then some things aren't. So tracking your expenses for three months will help you really start to understand that. I think a lot of people get really beat themselves up when they start tracking their expenses because they're like, oh, you know, it. I really didn't know how much I spent on groceries and then they get upset that it's way more than they estimated or they forget about some kind of core expense. I see this a lot with things like school fees. Like, you know, your kid comes home and they're like, oh, I got school pictures. Oh, you got to pay this activity fee. Like things like that that just kind of sneak up on you. Give yourself grace when you first start budgeting and tracking expenses because it's going to take a while. You aren't going to know how to do it from the beginning. I have been tracking my expenses for 15 years. I've been putting them every month on the internet for over 10 years and it's different every month. But knowing that average helps me understand what that bare minimum is. So let's say we got a thousand. We've got that $200 uh, that is going towards our business expenses. That's our bare minimum business expenses. It's not the extra things like the sinking funds. We got we take another $240 out of that out of taxes. So now we've got $440 that before I do anything else has come out of that $1,000. And you're like, damn, that is the worst part about being a freelancer, right? Is that, you know, you start spending that money in your head and then you realize that there's stuff you don't even get, you don't even get to see again. So now we're only down to 560. So the 560 from that check, what thing is it gonna go to first? Let's say your rent happens to be $500. That's pretty good rent these days, but let's just say it's $500. Okay, you know you gotta pay that. $500 goes to that first because we wanna make sure we still got uh, the walls around us. And then you're like, okay, my utilities are $50. We put it there. What it helps you do if you know that bare minimum Let's say you're someone like me that might get paid like, you know, sometimes I get $20,000 at once, but then I need to make that $20,000 last for six months. So when I get that $20,000, first thing, I'm going to put those taxes away because otherwise I'm going to spend too much of it. Then I'm going to put the business expenses away that need to be paid. I might budget those business expenses out for months, right? You know, I might actually put it far out. I usually try to be at least a month out in my business expenses uh, when money comes in. Uh, part of that is because I have Patreon, which by the way, if you don't know about, is the Personal Finance Society. I send you stickers. They help support the work of Oh My Dollar. Um, and they're just people that support us on Patreon. But one of the advantages of Patreon is even though I have variable income, people come and they go as they can kind of afford it or they value it. Um, but I know how much I'm going to get the next month. Um, and so I'm like, okay, I got like 400. I've got 600 coming in from Patreon the next month. And that allows me to be like, okay, I know how long I've got to make this last and work on my business expenses. And my core business expenses are between like 200 and 250 a month. And so from that money that comes in from Patreon, I allocate that to the business expenses immediately. So actually, um, Actually understanding like what your bare minimum is um, will help you have a better idea. So if you've got that $20,000 in and I know that my um, average monthly expenses are about $1,500 and that my core expenses are uh, about a thousand dollars, a thousand, eleven hundred dollars, and like fifteen hundred is include you some things that I don't always have to do, like figure skating, for example. If things were really bad, I would, I would not be going spending the money I am on figure skating. 
So that is $6,600. So if I get in, let's say I get a $10,000 check in, I take the money out for taxes, I take the money out for business expenses, then I know, okay, 6,600 of that, that $10,000, I, uh, I have six months before it is panic time. <laughs> I've got six months to bring in another check, right? So that is really, really helpful if you're getting, if you have variable income that is extremely variable. So a very common thing are students. Um, so if you are a graduate student and you get paid once a semester, perhaps from your teaching fellowship, or you're a student that gets student loan refund checks and you have to make them last all semester or all quarter, then this is a great example because instead of getting that $3,000 in, spending it all the first week and then living like a pauper the rest of the quarter, you're able to go, okay, I got a $3,000 student loan refund check. I got 10 weeks to make this last. How much do I have each week? Um, one of the things you can do if you have that extremely variable income with variable income is give yourself a paycheck. So if you get that extremely variable income from something like a business, you get a huge order, you've got to make that last, send yourself a paycheck so that you can kind of have that certainty, but do it to yourself. So that could be, uh, you know, put all your money in the account and then transfer it into checking every week or every month. Um, and that's the money you have to spend. This is especially good if you are the kind of person that checks your bank account balance to see how much you have, which is a really big problem if you need to save for taxes, right? So transfer it into the account you can see and then use that as your paycheck. If you're a cash-based person who likes cash, you could take um, your weekly allowance out in cash and that makes it a lot easier to uh, manage kind of that impulse that can be really challenging if you have variable income, especially if you've got that highly variable income. Um, Possum Planner says, I hear that from a lot of creators on Patreon. This literally pays my bills. It is so, so helpful for me as someone that um, really uh, has a lot of like kind of core expenses in the business. And then it's just helpful. It, it just means that I don't have to cover all of the expenses of running Oh My Dollar, of getting books. So we do, I do a lot of work in the community with, um, with low income youth. And in particular, I use those, uh, I use the money from that to help buy books. Uh, you know, I donate my time to the organizations that I work with teaching personal finance, but then I'm able to give them copies of my book, thanks to the personal finance society. Possum Planner says, oh my God, I wish I could run a million miles in cheap sneakers. I will say these were very fancy sneakers that I just got very cheap. So um, they are like, so I live in the same town where Nike and Adidas are. So you can get often like not at all used dead stock or uh, barely used Adidas and Nike sneakers at the Goodwill. So that's why I buy all my sneakers there. Um, I have really screwed up feet because I'm a figure skater. <laughs> and therefore no sneakers are really going to be comfortable for me um I also have rheumatoid arthritis so I have like arthritic feet I just I got a lot I got bunions I got um but I'm also not that great of a runner I run like you know on my best days eight mile pace ten mile pace I just do it for the cardio I'm not I'm not trying to win any races but um I probably, if I would investigate how to have better sneakers then I would get spoiled to that um, I thought I was never going to be able to run more than 20 minutes due to pain, but it turned out I needed actual running shoes. Shoes. Who knew? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is I'd, I wouldn't wear like Walmart sneakers just because I have too many friends that are really into running and like work at Nike and Adidas and they would absolutely not let me wear like really cheap sneakers. But yeah, I get my stuff at Goodwill um, because it's just not an area that I want to spend a ton of money on. I get really like upset at how running <laughs> expensive running shoes are, um, but I'm in the like the place where footwear is really expensive for me um, is figure skating because I am a high level skater and I also have very screwed up feet. And because of that, I have to get custom skates. So next year, one of the things I've been saving up for putting a little money in every time I have a little extra money left after all of those core expenses into a sinking fund is replacing my skates. So my skates are 20 years old. That is not how long custom skates usually last. Mine lasted that long because I took 15 years off from the sport, but I really need new skates. I can't just replace the skates I have because the company's out of business. I've talked about this on a ton of live streams. 
Um, but skates are really expensive at the type that I have because my feet are the way they are. I cannot get stock boots. I can't just like buy regular skates. I have to get them custom made because my feet are made of just a wild, sh they're just, they're like a triangle pretty much. Um, I got bone spurs, I got hammer toes, I got bunions, I got like their quadruple D width on the front and their triple A width on the back. If you know anything about shoes, it's just not good. Uh, two different sizes and I also need like a lot of structure because of the stuff I do. Um, anyway, I am gonna have to probably spend about $3,000 on new skates next year and I have been uh, saving up money for that. Uh, still, I'm not gonna like it, but I'm making it a little more, you know, kind of makes it a little fun. Uh, Rachel says, I need to budget a little money that's coming up for new running shoes over at Foot Traffic. Good tip about Nike Adidas Deadstock, though. Yeah, I mean, Foot Traffic is also a great store. Um, also, you live in Portland. You can talk, you can talk to people. People will be able to get you an employee store pass if you want to get stuff new. If it's Nike or Adidas shoes, uh, like, there are employee stores and you should be able <laughs> to get a pass. If you, if you don't know anybody... Or a friend of a friend. Just let me know. I'm sure I can find someone to get you an employee pass. Um, Jenny says, for my school kids fees, uniforms, and school shoes, I have a sinking fund of $200 a month. Uh, that seems high to me, but I guess including uniforms as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that I think is very, like, uh, helpful. Also, I don't have kids, so I don't really know how much those things cost. Um, that's also 200 Canadian dollars, which is slightly smaller, depending on the month. Uh, than U.S. dollars. K-Walk Comedy says, uh, uh, it, did I miss the donut? Nope, it's right here. It is a fritter. We're going to have it in just a bit. Um, hey, what I have more variable income tips, especially about um, some accounts that I use for uh, budgeting, but I want to eat this donut. Um, Jenny's brick phone is more than 12 years old. It's more than 12 years old. I am very impressed with you, Jenny. You are a legend. <laughs> I am so impressed. Um, that also speaks to the fact that if you don't get a smartphone, you don't have the depreciate, like the, you know, it getting deprecated happens more slowly. Uh, it's just a feature phone, apparently. Um, Rachel says, I'm nutty for amortization right now. Like I have eight annual fees that I got that I've got that need paying over the year in a table in each category for how much in there each end of month. That is awesome. Yeah, I I'm a huge fan of like really figuring out like how much things are going to cost you and then using that reverse psychology on yourself to make it feel like a smaller amount. And then it also doesn't make you extremely stressed um, when when you get hit by the all of a sudden fee. I also say for my, I only pay annual fees on one of my cards um, where I've decided it's it's worth it to me because, you know, I, obviously I do a lot of points. I usually sign up for a card and then I cancel or product change to a no annual fee card. Um, but I only pay annual fees on one of my cards right now, but I do budget for that each month. And that also luckily is a business expense. If you're a freelancer, bank fees are um, a business expense in the U.S., so... Christy says there was an Adidas employee pass in the last, last TriMet newsletter. Fancy. Um, so go look at your TriMet newsletter. Uh, <laughs> uniforms are obligatory at all schools here, including specific highly overpriced shoes. Darn, man, that sucks. I can't imagine as someone who, uh, I did want a uniform when I was in school and I actually just made my own uniform in high school. Um, where I just wore the same black shirt, black tie, and black jeans. Remember, I was emo when it was the early 2000s. Uh, but I wore the same ones every day just so I didn't have to think about it. But, uh, which is kind of funny now because I just love clothes so much. But, you know, I really struggled with the, like, how to be femme in the... It, it's complicated. We don't need to get into my own uh, evolving style. <laughs> uh, but the... Uh, yeah, the, I, I wanted a uniform, but I could not have done the uniform shoes. I would have been really frustrated by that because I had really bad feet <laughs> from skating. They were always bleeding and in pain. 
Uh, Rachel said, I started doing the small monthly accumulation when I was hit with a $2,000 annual disability insurance fee. And I was like, okay, I got to cancel this and I'll get a new policy in the year once I've saved up. Man, that is a really high um, disability insurance fee, but I am glad that you have it. And I... Uh, I hope once you've said, I hope you did not uh, need it for that year that you didn't get it. Um, I have always said I haven't been able to get disability insurance um, because of my RA, but I may have found a plan that will cover me um, as long as it's not a pre existing condition and I don't get disabled because of it in the two years leading up to it. Um, I haven't actually officially try to sign up for it yet but i think i might have found a policy and if i did find a policy that'll cover me um then i will let you all know i think the other flip side of it is sometimes i can't get covered uh because not just because of the ra but because of the um uh because of the drug i'm on does have the side effect of cancer uh, uh low low uh likelihood one of the most treatable cancers that is likely but yeah it has a side effect of cancer so there's reasons why it can't be insurable just because of that drug um the overpriced polo shirt with the school's name on bordered on it or 40 dollars each i have issues because if i'm gonna get a 40 dollars shirt it might as well be cute uh kids uniform shoes are thankfully only 120 dollars but frequently primary specific shoes were $250 that's extra frustrating because kids shoes like only last like six months before they grow out of them you better tell them they can't can't change their feet gotta bind their feet so they don't change they are not cute I hear about it every damn morning 250 during the years that kids are constantly outgrowing shoes that's ridiculous I agree all right, y'all, let's eat a donut. And then um, if you want me to talk about some of the freelancer specific accounts and stuff that I use, I'm also happy to show you. I've I've been working on this to give it out as a perk to the Patreons. Um, my so I have a, a spreadsheet that I use um, that I, I kind of input from YNAB. So I'm updating it so that you don't have to use YNAB to like make it work for you here. I have to download it on the iPad. Um, but I have like a Google sheet that I use for all my business expenses. Um, and it is very helpful because it does kind of the tax tax calculations for me. It also like estimates my home office deduction so that I don't save more for taxes than I need because I'd get a home a big home office deduction. Um, so I'm hoping to include this as a Patreon perk this month. I'm still finishing it up because I'm trying to make it make graphs for you and do pretty stuff. Uh, I'm getting very extra with this spreadsheet that maybe five people will use, but whatever, it's fine. Um, let's do the donut. And... Okay, so the donut is a butterscotch apple fritter, and it's made with local Oregon um, Granny Smith apples. Look at that beautiful bottom there. And then it's a vegan butterscotch topping. I can already tell I'm definitely going to need this napkin. Glad I brought one. Rachel says useful spreadsheets are as good for ourselves as for anyone else you might make them for. Well, I already use a spreadsheet. I'm trying to adapt this so it's useful for other people. Um, I already use a spreadsheet, but I combined it with Excel and YNAB. And I don't want to make assumptions that people have those. So I'm making it a more complicated version. Ooh. The butterscotch is strong. Look at this. I'll show you the one I use right now. But I'm upping it. Um, I'm not really getting the granny apple very much, but there's a big chunk right there, so I'm about to eat one. Oh, yeah.
This is delicious. I might also be hungry and expecting the sugar to erase the tiredness. But let's try. I like it though. I think it's a four out of five. I... I don't love how sugary the butterscotch is, but I realize that's like part of the point of butterscotch. And I wish there were like a few more apples in it, but all around, really good fritter. We need more sound effects to go with the donut ratings. Yes, that is true. Newbold uh, one says open office user here and I would absolutely be glad of a spreadsheet with prints out graphs, etc. Well, it is a Google sheet, which is what I decided to do um, just because uh, just because that is more sustainable than having people download open office. But all right. Uh, I will show you guys what the spreadsheet looks like, but I'm I'm really expanding it. So it has, this is my income. So that's like the gross income that goes up the top. And then it's my operating expenses other than charity. And then my target charity is 5% um, for Oh My Dollar. So that is actually just a fill-in there for me. Um, and then how much my charity actual was. And then my home office deduction is based on my... Um, trying to see if I can see notes on here, but I can't. Um, there's a note on there though, but it's $180 a month, which is essentially the percentage of my apartment that is used just as my office. That amount I can deduct as my home office deduction. So then I'll have the expenses. It also uh, calculates out my 401k target because um, I have a SEP IRA. So the max I can contribute to that is 25% of my gross income so it'll calculate that out and then i send my send that money based on this spreadsheet each month over to my sep ira um and then that's what my tax gross is after my solo 401k and that'll tell me what my goal is um which is 30 percent of that so that overall is what that looks like and then that feeds this spreadsheet so this spreadsheet if I make this out has because I was also working a day job, it would t transfer in the gross uh, after all my expenses um, and my SEP IRA because that comes out that's pre-tax dollars um, over into this spreadsheet. And that would allow me to calculate out what my savings rate was and everything like that. And uh, it also does the calculations over here of what my hourly rate is for the year because I track all my time. So last year I made $15 an hour from my dollar and I made $29 an hour from my day job, which wasn't actually what I made, but it was like, you know, accounting for like PTO. So that's like extra. It's a little bit more than I made. Um, and then the $19 column is just interest and miscellaneous. So that'll be things like cash back from coupons and stuff like that. And then this line was for that money, this extra $1,400 I got back because I paid my taxes too soon. And then there was stimulus in there. And then that's how much my goal, because my goal was to earn uh, $58,000 a year. And um, yeah, so that's what the spreadsheet looks like. Truly talking dough and eating donuts. Yeah, I'm actually living up to the name of the stream, huh? Geograph Concepts says, I have to go work on midterms, but I'm very glad I got to see the donut. It looks very, very good. I agree. Um, yeah, so I'm... Uh, I have been working on... Oh, yeah, and this has my hours worked across everything and whether or not I'm on track for it. Uh, and those are auto-filling emojis, but this is the one that I'm working on uh, where it's going to be a full dashboard. So... You're going to be able to actually input your business bookkeeping 
and fill in your retirement savings goals um, and your personal tax rate in case your tax rate is not 30% it will default to 30. Um, and then there's a home office deduction little like workspace right down here that will help you sort of calculate that out. And then this one is going to be for business expenses. And then this will be cost of goods sold. And then it'll make your make you a little um, chart for your personal expenses and then your business expenses. So I'm still working on it. It's really going to be doing a lot. Um, but I am excited to be able to give it. And then it'll have the savings and stuff like that. So it'll be a little less specific to me. Um, everybody is very upset with Jenny with Jenny's principal because the principal called me to berate me for being a bad parent reminding me I had signed a contract because I got in trouble because my child outgrew the school specific shoes one month before school was ending and I sent her to school in non school specific shoes it's crap I don't like it Rachel says I wonder if sometimes principals forget they're talking to other grown ass adults with that kind of stuff I know it's like come on guys just be reasonable uh, Eric says, this is really a thing, right? It is, uh, talking to and eating donuts right there. So, yeah, that's what I'm working on. I will have that due. Um, K, K Walk Comedy says, as a principal, I would never do that. Are you a principal or are you just like, that's what you would do? Uh, if you were a principal. Both are valid. I think as adults, we can decide what we we're going to do. <laughs> I think that this is just like a... What happens when you get on power trips as an administrator, right? And you're not like, this is when you are, you believe everything should be by the book, even when it doesn't make sense. But imagine having to buy those $250 shoes again. Um, Jenny says, the principal definitely talked to me like I was a badly behaved eight-year-old. I did not appreciate it, especially as a healthcare worker during a pandemic. You can just end any sentence with that. I, you've got like bragging rights for a very long time. There are bigger issues than shoes they need to worry about. Agreed. Parent shaming, not a part of my job description. Yes, I'm a principal. Middle school, prayer accepted. <laughs> well, good to know that if uh, Jenny enrolls their kids in your school, they will would not be shamed for uh, not buying shoes. Uh, it is super exclusionary. I think that's very unreasonable. Um, but it's also a public school, I believe, right? Uh, because, like, it's in Canada, all the schools are uniform there. Because <clears throat> they came from Britain. So. Um, y'all, I know I should talk about more stuff, but frankly, one, my, uh, arrival window for my phone is, starts in 10 minutes, and I don't know if I have enough stamina in me after all the sun yesterday. I really thought that I would have more, uh, I really thought I would have more energy to talk more about variable income. I guess here's the thing that I can show you really quick before we get off, um, is that there's two, I think, very helpful, um, very helpful apps that are banks that you can use as a freelancer. So a lot of people use Wave. I link to it down below in the description. Um, but the freelancer bank I actually use, I use two ones to do my tax savings. One of them, which I linked down below, is called Lily. And what the advantage of Lily is, is that it is a bank that is designed for freelancers. So it will automatically put a percentage of each check that you get into an account for your taxes. Um, this is the one I use, not just because when it came out, it was the only one. Um, there is one other one and it is called um, Found Bank. And I also link to it down below in the description. Um, both of them have some kind of integrated bookkeeping. So they will both flag things that you spend on the account that could be business expenses. So if you're self-employed and you don't have like a ton of cost of goods sold and very complicated accounting to do, like someone that maybe sells uh, physical objects like I do, 
Um, if you're just like a freelancer mainly, these can be very good for getting your basic bookkeeping and both of them allow you to send digital invoices. So if you're someone that just hates invoicing, really wants to put it off, um, these banks could both be really good options for you and it will automatically categorize something that you could then print out and hand to your accountant or try to use when you file your own taxes and fill in your Schedule C. Um, but what I really like is the nice invoices that you can send. So yeah. Um, Sinking Funds was a really awesome concept. Fruitful stream and thank you. So great. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, and knowing your bare minimum, I think is really important. Um, so the other thing I will recommend for some people works well. I still use YNAB. I was using Wave for a bunch of years. They raised the price um, if you needed it to account for cost of goods sold. I used to use it because it'll let me scan my receipts just automatically um, and then allocate them and sort them. Now, instead, I use what's called Genius Scan and I scan all my receipts because you have to hold on to those receipts if you're a freelancer, but they don't have to be in physical format. I scan all my receipts for my business expenses and then I just upload it to the cloud because you uh, because I track my expenses elsewhere. I just need to know that I have all the receipts. Your accountant does not want that shoebox full of receipts. Your accountant just wants the totals you spent in each expense category. However, if you get audited, the IRS will want you to produce the actual receipts. Credit card statements don't work, um, nor do your own bookkeeping. Um, so I just upload them digitally. I scan them so that the they can be searched and I stick them in iCloud and I do it with a free piece of software. I used to use Wave though. Wave works really well um, if you are someone, once again, that is mostly a freelancer um, and it lets you create invoices and stuff like that. If you are someone that absolutely will not, by the way, these are all linked in Oh My Dollar episodes, um, but if you are someone that knows you would never scan receipts and you have that shoebox full of receipts, uh, then really awesome thing is this company called Shoeboxed. And yes, you can scan things automatically. Or what you can do is you can, they'll send you an envelope and you s stuff the envelope full of receipts and send it to them and they'll scan and categorize everything. Um, so the it's just a good way to get rid of the receipts and outsource a very annoying part of being a business owner if you'd like to. If you don't need to fully outsource accounting, but you just are not gonna handle those receipts, um, Shoebox can be a really good option for people. I think it's like $9 per envelope or something like that. So, um, and you could stuff a lot of receipts in there. So, save the shoeboxes, yes. But also please don't drop them off at your CPA or tax preparer's office. Um, uh, K-Walk was a pandemic principal. I became a principal in 2020, so I don't know life without empathy. Wow, what a time to become a principal. Uh, Jenny says that is a brave career choice. Yeah, that is uh, some serious stuff right there. Um, Newbold1 says they farm out to gig style workers, I think. Yeah, but it's easier than having to hire your own people to do it like you could absolutely hire someone some gig worker you could find an assistant you could ask someone on twitter to do it for you or you could just pay them and they do the outsourcing for you so um you know yeah uh k walk says make sure you hit the thumbs up people the principal and me giving orders <laughs> thank you for the reminder y'all <laughs> i appreciate the shout out k walk um uh Adabee says there is, uh, is it Adabee or Adabee, by the way? I was pronouncing it Bay, and then I was like, I don't know if that's correct. Um, uh, there is a business for literally everything. There is absolutely a business for everything. Um, although accounting is, uh, if you want to start a business that will always be in demand, make something that is very frustrating about running a business easier because there will continue to be people like solve an inefficiency in the market. And one of the inefficiencies is that scanning your receipts is not a good use of a lot of freelancers' times. Um, Eric says, like, and subscribe y'all. You're so great. Thank you. <laughs> um, there's no flu for the week this week. However, if you are a patron, uh, if you are part of the personal finance society, which you can join at ohmydollar.com slash support, please fill in the form that is sent to you when you sign up to submit a floof. Um, and if you sign up, you get sent a little welcome packet of stickers. It's one of my favorite things. Um, 
Like I said, it is not too late to join Budgetober. You're halfway through the month, but you can still do it. Uh, I'll still send you stickers. Uh, and so if you got excited about trying to figure out what your like core expenses are or tracking a category, join on omedello.com slash Budgetober. Uh, very fun. And uh, submit those floofs, guys, so that we can have more cats to look at. Um, I am going to nap until I get woken up on this broke phone to get my new phone. And I am very excited about it. You know when you get, like, a new device, you're like, well, Jenny doesn't know anything about getting a new device because Jenny's had the same phone for 12 years. But when I get a new device, I always believe that I'm going to, like, turn over a new leaf. I think, I think, like... This time, my home screen is going to be the most organized thing. Or, like, this time, I'm not going to hold on to apps that I don't need anymore. Um, so, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm going to do that. I'm excited. I'm, I'm trying not to be too stressed about getting a new phone and the fact that that means I have to buy all new accessories for it. Uh, last time to pick which case to get, which worked really well until I ran over the physical screen of my phone with my bike. Um, the, uh, this case, uh, I watched, I think, five plus hours of YouTube reviews of iPhone cases. I think one of the advantages, but slash disadvantages, is that the, um, Mini 13, they stopped making the mini size. So there's actually way fewer cases produced for the Mini 13. So at least it kind of narrows the scope, but it is annoying because I keep finding stuff that I'm like, I want that one, and then it's not available for it. Uh, Jenny says, my husband just bought me a new typewriter. That's sort of a new device. Mmm, fresh typewriters. I used to have a cursive typewriter, and it was like my favorite thing. Um, all right, y'all. Thank you all for joining. Um, and uh, let me know what you're looking forward to in the next week before we go. I, well, first I'm looking forward to a nap. And then after that, I am looking forward to the final collation of all of the Budgetober um, apps, all the things people did from last month. I'm really looking forward to that because it's been a long time. I've been working on it for weeks because uh, I'm making a mega blog post of it. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being done with that because it's kind of been hanging over my head, so. Uh, Atabay says, I got the Mini 13 too. Atabay is right. Okay, cool. Um, Possum says, Otterbox. I hate spending so much on a case, but cheaper than replacing phone. Yes, absolutely. That's actually what I ordered because they were like weirdly half price on Amazon. But the other thing too for me is that I, it has the MagSafe in it. So I want, I want the MagSafe components. Um, I really like to have a wallet on my phone so if you can't tell the wallet but the downside of the wallet is with the wireless charging it wasn't working it doesn't work and i have to take the cards out to do that um so with the new mag safe i can just like attach the wallet to the back and take it out so atabay says thanks again i got some homework to do for my budget jenny is sewing a glow-in-the-dark dress for halloween i am looking forward i hope that you like post pictures of that on the forum or something that sounds awesome um or submit it as flu for the week you can be the flu for the week as a ghost you know we've got a very broad range of what is flu for the week all right y'all um i will see you next week stay safe stay healthy pet a cat if you have one available stay hydrated and i guess stay out of the sun because man whew, i am tired uh see you soon Bye.